You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, David. Hello, Will. And hello, listeners. Welcome to episode 119 of the Common Descent Podcast. Welcome back. Today, we will be discussing India. Every now and then we'll do an episode about a specific part of the world. Mm-hmm. And I know there are people who have been waiting a while for us to get around to India. Yes, this was a highly requested topic. So we'll be discussing India today, and we'll be going over the country, of course. You know, India, you might have heard of it. The landmass. The landmass. Talk a little bit about what it's like today, who lives there, and then talk a bit about how it's changed over time. And there's a lot to talk about with India because it has moved around a bunch. India has a fascinating geological history. Yes. It's got a history of travel. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> it is a nomadic landmass. <laughs> and so we will be discussing India through its ages and some of the different life forms that have called it home over during that time, but also the path it's taken and the way it's affected the landscape around it while it's been moving. Very cool. We are, of course, discussing this because it's awesome, but also because it was requested. By who? This episode was requested by Nathan, Rama Simha, Zabi, MJ, Ann Arachne, Caitlin, and a curious viewer from our 2020 Q&A. Well, thanks, everybody. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of people rooting for India out yes. there. Now, some of these also were for the Himalayas, so don't worry, those will get mentioned this episode. <laughs> because you can't mention, you can't talk about India without talking about the Himalayas. I would think. It's just not allowed. Simply isn't done. Now, before we get into our episode, as usual, we do have a few announcements. Just a couple. Our first announcement is always our first announcement, which is we have a Patreon. We do, where people can subscribe to give us money. And that money has now gotten to the point where it funds everything we do, and it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And when you join us on Patreon, not only do you support us, but you also get some extra bonus goodies. And if you join us at a certain level, one of those goodies is that we like to shout your name out in gratitude here on the podcast. So thank you and welcome, Logan, Oscar, Michaela, and Shelly. Hey, thanks everybody to our new patrons and all of our old patrons and all of our future maybe patrons. If you are not a patron right now, consider it. We put up extra cool stuff. We do bonus audios, things like that. It's a great way to support the podcast if you like us and the stuff that we do, or if you're just generally a fan of free science education for the public, Patreon is a great way to show us your appreciation. Absolutely. And on the note of doing bonus stuff, coming up here in the next month in September, we will be going to DragonCon. In person. In person, again, finally. And we will be participating as guest professionals on a few panels. Yeah, so if you're going to be at DragonCon, keep an eye out for us. We've gotten the tentative schedule Mm -hmm. of the panels we might be on. And the list so far includes a panel about dinosaurs. Unsurprisingly. A panel about crabs. (laughs) Which is great. (laughs) A panel about speculative evolution. Of course. Which we're very excited about. And then a few others about mosquitoes and warfare in nature and licking science. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> like you do. So it should be it should be a lot of fun. We should get to sit out on panels with a bunch of other nerdy scientists and talk about the kind of stuff that we like to talk about. Oh, it's always a ton of fun. I love Dragon Con so much. I'm looking forward to going back and I'm looking forward to seeing people there. So if you're there, come say hi. We'll be happy to say hi. Please do. Get a pin from us. Yeah. We will bring little Common Descent pins to hand out. Also, we will see, we've done it in the past, about recording at least one of these panels to then release as audio on the the podcast. Uh, We'll have to see exactly what our capabilities are, but we're hoping to get to do that. So keep your ears out. If you're not going to Dragon Con, you might still get to hear some of what we've done. Yeah, there may be some extra audio to come from it. And with that, we can wrap up our announcements. We only had a couple this time, which brings us to the news section. Every episode, we like to gather up some recent news articles, some recent publications in the worlds of geoscience, paleontology, evolution, those kinds of topics that interest us and we hope interest you. To help us all stay up to date with what's going on in the scientific world, I turn it over to David. I'm going to talk about pterosaurs. 
All right, that sounds awesome. We talk about pterosaurs a lot on the podcast. These are the flying reptiles of the Mesozoic era, the pteranodons and pterodactyls and so forth. I've got a bit of research here for our first news about the flight abilities, maybe, of baby pterosaurs. Oh. Yeah. This is research by Darren Nash, Mark Witten, and Elizabeth Martin Silverstone in Scientific Reports. And in our blog post, hey, I have every episode, there's a blog post on our blog with additional links, including links to the news. We will put a link to the article about this research in Science News by Carolyn Gramling. Pterosaurs were the first vertebrate animals to achieve flight. We talked about that back in episode 79. (laughs) And we know a lot about the flight abilities of adult pterosaurs. But there has been a lot of discussion about what pterosaurs were like when they were little or newborns. Could they fly straight out of the egg? Yeah, were they flapping around or were they like birds are today where they're just helpless and sitting in the nest? And this has been discussed and debated. There are a number of different hypotheses that have been put forward. Uh, the The paper lists a few uh, and gives them uh, fun names, which is delightful. The flap early hypothesis, which suggests that pterosaurs could fly basically right away, which is weird to think about today because birds and bats don't really do that. Yeah. Although there are exceptions. The fly late hypothesis suggests that pterosaurs could not fly until they were, you know, half or so their adult size, which is more like what we see in most birds today. And then, of course, there is a middle ground, as there always is, the glide early hypothesis that baby pterosaurs might have been able to glide, if not fully powered flight. Oh, they're flying squirrel phase. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Recent previous research has examined young and even embryonic pterosaurs, you know, pterosaurs preserved within the eggs, and have found that when they're very young, pterosaurs already have well-developed bones, they have wing membranes, their body proportions are similar to adults, even when they're embryos. All right. Which has led some support to this idea that, yeah, maybe they were actually flying when they were little. This study set out to be what is seemingly the first study to analyze the biomechanical capabilities of young pterosaurs to actually examine the skeleton to determine their flight ability. They looked at very young hatchling, or what I have seen uh, sometimes are called flapling pterosaurs. (laughs) Accepted. And also embryo pterosaurs, mostly from the genus uh, Pterodostro and the genus Synopterus. Specifically, they were looking at the humerus. There was a special focus on the humerus. And they quantified the strength of the wing bones, the wing loading, so how much the wing can support the body, the shape of the wing, right, the the length, the aspect ratio, all the sorts of things you need to know to be an engineer and calculate the efficiency of flight. Yeah, the aerodynamics of this little biological plane. And what they found is that the wing bones are similar in strength to adult pterosaurs, which they interpret as say they seem to be capable of withstanding the forces of flight and takeoff, because we've discussed previously that there, it, it is suspected that pterosaurs used their wings to take off, which is a big push-up to take off. And in addition to that, the size and shape of their wings are in line with what we would expect to see in animals that are capable of gliding and powered flight. Wow. So at least based on this information, it seems these baby pterosaurs might have been able to fly right right off the bat. Oof. That's that's such a weird image, just because just it's so alien to the birds and bats that we know today, typically. Yeah. It does make me... I like to imagine it in the obviously unrealistic scenario of a pterosaur baby just bursting out of the egg into the sky yeah no it's just well it's like those <laughs> poppers that you pull on the new year's eve that you just the eggs just go pop 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 pop, pop and bur- yeah. <laughs> little pterosaur babies just flying into the air like a fetty well it really makes them a lot like you know if you think of like a gazelle mm-hmm. or a zebra or something it's like you are able to up and move within you know hours or whatever of your birth just also flying yeah you just you know defying gravity because yeah being active right after birth is not an unusual thing in animals. We're we're just so trained to think of flight as this difficult thing that you have to learn how to do. 
mm-hmm. you know, or practice how to do, it's a weird concept that you could do it early. Now, they do make the point that even if these pterosaurs could fly right off the bat, the shape of their wing is different from adults, and size has a big impact on what you're capable of doing when you fly. So, if they could fly from being very young, their capabilities in the air would have changed as they got older. They would have been likely doing different things throughout their lives. Very young pterosaur wings seem to have probably been better for slow, maneuverable flight, the kind of flight that is good in cluttered environments, like forests and stuff, good for escaping predators, and good for hunting small, maneuverable prey, like insects and stuff. Yeah, these are all the features we see in bat wings. Yes, and also in a lot of small, especially like forest-dwelling birds. Mm -hmm. Whereas larger pterosaurs, as they became adults, their wings grow larger in size, but also different in shape, making them less maneuverable, but probably better at flight over long distances, probably living and hunting in open environments. They also made the point that for especially large pterosaurs, they may have gone through many different phases (laughs) in their life of being able, being best suited to flight in different environments. Ooh, that's awesome. That's flight niche partitioning. Yes. Within your own species. That's so cool. Yeah. It also, of course, has implications for the question of pterosaur precociality Mm -hmm. versus altricialness. The idea of are they taking care of themselves right away or do they need to be cared for uh, by parents? And being able to fly right away does not necessarily mean that you don't need to be taken care of by parents because my gazelle example before, just because you can walk doesn't mean you should (laughs) leave the herd yeah that you don't still need protection or feeding but if they couldn't fly right away that feels a lot more like modern day birds who definitely in most cases need parental care so this isn't a definite one way or the other but it certainly has implications for what baby pterosaur lives were like well and you can easily visualize a scenario where there's not a lot of parental care if you're flying right away from birth and are actively adapted to fly in a different place than your adults yes like and hunt different things that's how that's what we see in groups that are trying to not compete with their grown-ups or babies yes our <laughs> go-to example is always crocodilians mm-hmm. yes a baby alligator lives a very different life from a mama alligator which is real handy because once you're big enough that you're not being taken care of anymore you don't want to be anywhere near an adult alligator yeah you are either food or competition <laughs> Very cool. Well, speaking of prehistoric flying things, Hmm. my first bit of news is about a giant vampire bat. Oh. Yeah. Described in research by Santiago Brizuela and Daniel Tassara in the journal Ameghiniana. The article we'll be linking to is by Rinko de Lazaro in Sinus. This vampire bat named Desmodus Draculae was found in central South America from the Pleistocene uh, and seems to have lived in that area up until the early Holocene. Okay. Yeah. So as recently as several thousand years ago. Absolutely. So this bat belongs to the same subfamily as today's vampire bats, the Desmodontinae. Uh, But this one had a wingspan of about 50 centimeters or 20 inches. That's a decent size for a bat, especially vampire bats, which are not very big. No, vampire bats are actually fairly small bats. Uh, and they ex- estimate a body mass of about 60 grams, which is like two ounces. So a hefty bat. Pretty hefty bat. <laughs> uh, makes it by far, uh, from what they said, the largest known vampire bat. Cool. Which is not surprising at that size. Very likely its food source was the same as today's vampire bats, which is blood. Hematophagy. Today's vampire bats typically feed on like birds and mammals. Yeah, uh, you'll see those uh, uh, famous videos of them, like, nipping at the heels of cows and stuff. Yeah, and, like, the tip of the ear and things like that. Little mm. areas off to the edge where they can just nick a capillary. It's very likely that Draculae was doing the same thing. This study looked at a new fossil, a jaw from Argentina, that dates back to about 100,000 years old. So late Pleistocene. And what makes it interesting is where it was found. This jaw was found in what seems to be a cave-like structure, or burrow, potentially, (laughs) that is about 
1.2 meters across in diameter, so 3.9 feet, so like four feet across, mm. which means it could very likely be the burrow of a giant sloth, such as the ones from the family Mylodontidae, which are known to make burrows. Uh, th- this includes sloths like Skeletotherium. Yeah, we've talked about sloth burrows. Mm-hmm. There is a news, oh boy, sometime in the past four and a half years that we've been doing the podcast about the big tunnels down in South America that have been interpreted as giant ground sloth burrows. Absolutely. And we probably mentioned it in episode 24 about sloths. Yes, I think, I, I know I definitely mentioned the burrowing sloths. This seems like this bat might have been found in one of those burrows. Oh, I wonder what it was doing in there. Yeah, that's the question. <laughs> now, of course, we can't confirm what it was doing there. I mean, bats hang out in caves. Yeah, that's it a thing that they often do. Could just be looking for sanctuary here, you know, uh, to evade predators, to sleep, to yeah, stay raise, safe. Raise babies. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it could very well have been in there to feed on the giant furry mammal that made the burrow. Yeah, if you are a vampire bat, you don't need to go out to get insects and stuff every night if your food keeps coming back to sleep here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you just flap on down and take a little blood and go back up. So yeah, this big, a jaw of one of these big vampire bats was found in what seems to be one of these sloth burrows, very likely. That's a very intriguing association. Well, we talked in episode 118, the last episode, about trace fossils, about how sometimes you can get traces of one of a creature inside another tray inside a burrow. And whenever you find a creature inside of a burrow in the fossil record, there's always that interesting question of, all right, did you make this burrow? <laughs> and in this case, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> just a, a very industrious and were, were you just living in this burrow? Did you just make your home here? Is this like a, a rattlesnake making its home in a gopher tur- tortoise burrow? Or were you here for a reason? Like, was, the, was this specific place why you are here? Perhaps for the thing. Well, I, I don't know if there are uh, uh, vampire bats that do this today. Right. That like hang out in caves where I don't know the bears go or whatever. I don't know. Yeah. I, that's a lot of questions like that came up for me with with this big bat is were you, you know, were you big because there were bigger mammals for you to easily gain access to? You mm-hmm. know, that's always the question when we lost so many of our giant herbivores what how did that change did it also change our blood suckers right did did you sustain bigger hematophagy yeah little parasites and the other question that i'm desperate to know the answer to but probably will never get to is did these hop around on the ground like today's vampire bats yeah they lunged just just like a little it it would look like a really big rat just (laughs) hopping around awesome well speaking of unanswered questions my last bit of news my second bit of news is about the earliest known fossil animals. Wow. More specifically, some new candidates that might represent the earliest known fossil animals. Particularly sponges. Hmm. This is research in the journal Nature by Elizabeth Turner, and we will link to an article in Science News by Jake Bueller. The early fossil record of animals is a bit mysterious, as is the early fossil record of basically anything, because back at that time, animals would have probably been, the earliest ones would have been very small, probably very squishy, probably very rare. So we have a muddy view of what the earliest days, millennia, of (laughs) animal life were like. The oldest undisputed animals and near animals in the fossil record, go back to the Ediacaran period, which we've discussed at length, episode 31, which came right before the Cambrian period, following the Cambrian explosion, episode 9. And there is some possible chemical evidence of animals earlier than that, but that is often disputed. However, genetic studies have been used to estimate when the earliest animals may have arisen, and some of those estimates go back to the early Neoproterozoic as far back as a billion years ago. And if that's the case, then we've got this big early missing piece in the animal fossil record story. This study describes microfossils from early in the Neoproterozoic little tubey branching structures that this paper argues 
seem to be similar to structures produced by sponges. These little structures were found amidst ancient reefs. Now, you may be saying to yourself, but wait a minute, there, there were no animals. Yes, these were bacterial reefs. These were reefs built out of calcifying cyanobacteria. So nothing like reefs in episode 36 of the coral and stuff. The term bacterial reefs just makes me happy. Yeah. These are from the Stone Knife Formation in northwestern Canada, and they are 890 million years old. Oof. The researcher took thin sections of the remains of the reef and found what are known as vermiform microstructures. Tiny branching tubes, only 20 to 30 micrometers thick, clumped together in little clumps that were millimeters to centimeters in size. They described that in the past, these structures were thought to maybe be formed by algae or something similar, but more recent research has found that they are structures produced during the decomposition and decay of certain sponges, specifically a group called horny sponges. What happens is you have these little tubes of soft tissue that become filled in and enclosed in the sediment surrounding them, and in this carbonate sediment that creates these little branching tubes. Now, the article we will link to includes commentary from a few other researchers who are, not surprisingly, not totally convinced. And yeah, of course, these are very tiny fossils and a rather extraordinary discovery if true, so there's bound to be some healthy skepticism. Some say that similar structures could potentially be created by lots of different things, and we'd like to see more evidence to suggest that these are really sponges, the remains of sponges. Others suggest that the evidence we have seems to indicate that animals should not have been able to survive back then, Mm. based on oxygen levels and nutrients and stuff like that. However, this researcher publishing this paper, at the very least, finds these structures fairly convincingly similar to sponges. So, if not definitive, certainly worth looking into. And if that is true... This is a big deal. These are not only the oldest sponges, the oldest current definite sponges are early Cambrian, at about 540 million years old, or half the age of these. It says, like, yeah, old, but this is old, old. Yep. This would be a big extension for the earliest known uh, fossil record of animals, and it predates what is known as the Neoproterozoic Oxygenation Event. This was a time period between around 800 million years ago and the beginning of the Cambrian where oxygen levels rose to a significant percentage of modern day levels. In the past, some researchers have suggested that maybe the reason we don't see animals before that is because they couldn't survive in those low oxygen levels. If these are really the remains of sponges, then that seems to be not the case anymore that they would have been able to survive. That's really interesting. It's whenever we find evidence for a life in general, when you start going back this far, it always gets a, you know, a little more hazy, a little more contentious because that's, those are very old fossils. Mm -hmm. And when you start looking for, especially evidence of like animals, you know, our group compared to all the other bacterial groups and stuff. Yeah. We, we start, squinting our eyes a bit hard at the, that evidence uh, especially because yeah that'd be a huge leap yeah hundreds of millions of years older than our current oldest agreed upon fossils yeah. which isn't impossible you know that happens where if it's a group that's not prone to fossilization there is the you know very real scenario that yeah they could have shown up and then just their fossils became extremely rare or we just haven't dug in the right spot yet because they're not widespread. Or we didn't know what to look for. Yes, yeah. We may suddenly go, hey, these structures are all over the place once we know to test for them. Right. So this is not completely ridiculous. But yeah, this is a this feels like a, a good candidate for that old adage, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Mm-hmm. But yeah, th- this is something that we want to be extra doubly triple sure before we're just like, hey, did you know that sponges are almost a billion years old? Right. That, that's a big shift. <laughs> now, speaking of the limitations in where those early animals may have lived, 
One other interesting aspect of this study is pointing out that these potential sponge structures aren't found at all different parts of this ancient reef. They are specifically found along the flanks of the reef and in what are called void spaces, which suggests that the sponges were not living in quite the same spots as the bacteria that were creating the reef structures, which could mean that the sponges, if these are sponges, were doing well in low light conditions. It could also mean that these earliest animals couldn't compete with the cyanobacterial mats in this reef, that they couldn't live in the same place as them. So they had to live a little off to the side or in the little gaps within the reef. But since they are located close to this reef, the researcher also suggests as part of an answer to that question of, well, if oxygen levels were so low back then, how could animals, even something like a sponge, survive? It may not be a coincidence that these are found in a reef full of photosynthesizing bacteria, because, of course, photosynthesis produces oxygen. Oh, that makes sense. So maybe they were living on the fumes of the reef. Yeah, they were, they were, <laughs> the reef was their oxygen tank. Yeah. That, that's actually really interesting that the cyanobacteria were effectively terraforming that area of the ocean for them. Yep. And that allowed, that could have allowed animal life to persist. Yeah. So, like oh. we said, there's definitely more uh, to be dis described and discovered here. Healthy levels of skepticism for exciting new discoveries, but... I will be very interested to see what further research says on these finds. Yeah, absolutely. Very cool. Well, speaking of old animal groups, but still not nearly as old as that, my next bit of news is about a early microsaur, Ooh. which are a group of very early amniotes. And this one is named something cool and a really well-preserved fossil from a time that is kind not unique for this group, but unusual for this group. Cool. This is research by Arjan Mann et al., in the journal Royal Society Open Science, and the article we'll be linking to is by Mindy Weisberger in Live Science. So microsaurs were small, the, the name means small lizard. They were a group of small reptiles, early, early amniotes, potentially some of the oldest. And this is a new species identified for this group from a specimen that was about 310 million years old, was very well preserved and shows a long, skinny, it's a you know lizard e shaped that's kind of, if you picture a long skink like animal you're picturing kind of the right thing but of course they weren't lizards now long as in re relation to the shape of its body it was only about two inches long the whole thing <laughs> very very microsaur <laughs> yes microsaurs are a fitting name but this new species got the name jormungand bolti after jormungand the world serpent in, in norse mythology yep <laughs> the <laughs> serpent that could wrap around the world which is fun Part of the reason, though, that it's exciting is because the extreme preservation not only preserved most of the skeleton, uh, like they have a picture of it and it looks like a basically complete skeleton. So they got a really good look at the anatomy of it. It has long, skinny body, stubby little arms and legs, little limbs. It also had a tapered tailbone. Uh, the tail was not long and skinny. It tapered down. They actually commented that it looks very similar to lizards today. Like skinks and some geckos that store fat in their tail. Oh, interesting. So it has kind of a, a reminiscent shape to that. It also had a fairly tough skull, like reinforced fused bones in the skull. And there were impressions around the fossil that gave us a look at what the scales would look like. Ooh. The scales were oval shaped and ridged, which showed similar patterns to scales we see today on reptiles that are burrowers. And their scales are specialized for repelling dirt, for shedding the dirt and not getting it stuck in there. Gotcha. The short tapering tail also made me think of like big skinks that burrow through the mm -hmm. dirt as well. Yep, yep, yep. And the reinforced head, mm -hmm. that would be good for shoving the dirt out of the way, which a lot of your short-legged reptiles, that's how they burrow is they just shove their face into the dirt. Yep. And long skinny body, they think it probably would have moved very snake-like, you know, almost serpentine. Yep. So, and a lot of reptiles have developed long skinny bodies for burrowing. Yep. So almost certainly a burrower. It's got all the features, all the telltale signs. It's also tiny. Yes, it's which tiny. Which is also a common feature in burrowers. It's a worm microsaur. So on one hand, it's just a 
cool new species that's very well preserved and we get a really good look at probably how it was you know what it was adapted to do most likely but also most microsaur fossils are known from the permian so this one being from the carboniferous gives us a different look at the microsaur history and it being a earlier than most microsaur but still having this very skinny fossorial digging body plan gives insight to how quickly amniotes diversified when they started you know once animals started laying eggs they started getting weird fast it seems yeah uh, which is not what had necessarily been assumed but with this earlier member it's leaning things that way yeah more insight into the diversity of the earliest reptiles exactly which is very cool it's always a little bit fun to have a new fossil that is an exciting insight into the early evolution of this group you may have never heard about yes right (laughs) (laughs) this is an important group but from a time period that doesn't get discussed quite as often so yeah here is a answering questions that you didn't know people were asking yeah and it's yeah i didn't know what a microsaur was before i read this (laughs) i learned about them during this but it made a good point at the end that a lot of early reptiles were very lizard shaped Mm -hmm. you know that's what we are used to and that's what we kind of thought was the case for quite a while that they were just all very lizardy in general but with this being one of the very earliest you know if all the dating is accurate amniotes reptiles it might mean that there are we're getting weird way sooner than we thought so there might be other weird early reptiles out there to find yeah good stuff yeah and with that we can wrap up our news and start talking about india and how it looks today but also how it got to the way it looks today can't wait So India as a country is very well known. It's This is not a, an obscure small country. Right, I've heard of it once or twice. Yes, exactly. India is a large country in southern Asia. Uh, it is bordered on the west by Pakistan, by China, Nepal, and Bhutan in the north, and by Bangladesh and Myanmar on the east. India, not only the, a, a broad and interesting country right a human creation in its own right but a fascinating chunk of land oh yes and we will talk in at length about the geological history of this country and how it has changed over time but first what's it like today i've never been there me neither i would love to go there though listen we talked about patreon yes join us on page support us and pay for (laughs) us to go on a trip to india (laughs) india is the seventh largest country uh, which I didn't realize before I was looking this up. I cool. Yeah, I wasn't super surprised because it is big, but yeah, seventh largest and the second most populous by humans. That I knew. Yes. So full of people, large country, being a large chunk of land, it has a ton of different habitats in it. This goes all the way from tropical forests, you know, rainforests in northern areas, but then you also have coniferous, you know, conifer dominated forests along the mountain ranges there high altitude forests. yep there's a number of different kinds of deciduous forests i saw two mentioned uh in eastern india something called sal dominated which is a type of tree and then in central and southern india there was teak dominated for deciduous forests so you even have different kinds of deciduous forests in different areas you have thorn forests running through different areas and a ton of wetland habitats. Yeah. Uh, I saw it listed that about 18% of the country is wetland. Wow. So a lot of wetlands. There is a lot of coast. Yes. On India. So lots of area for lands to get wet. And therefore, with all of these different habitats, I mean, as we went over in our biome section. 115. I described all those by the plants. Yep. <laughs> that make them up. <laughs> You're welcome, Allie. <laughs> yep. We're learning from you. Lots of plant diversity here in India. I've seen it listed as one of the top richest in in flora uh, places in the world. That makes sense. Not really surprising, considering not only the diversity of habitats, but also this is a very warm place in the world. Yeah, lots of tropical space for plants to grow. Yes. (laughs) On that note, I found that India ranks in the top 10, so it's one of the top 10 most forest-rich countries on the planet. 
Cool. Yeah, so tons of forests there. About 22% of India's area is forest. And that number came back from 2010. And cheerfully, when I was finding it, that percentage has increased in recent years. So interesting. Not gone down, which I was very much expecting it to. I I was going to say 22% now. Yeah. (laughs) We are evidently at 24%. 0.56% 0.56% as of two years ago. Oh, well, hopefully a trend that will continue. Yeah, so a very forested country that's becoming more forested every day. Now, unsurprisingly, all this plant diversity leads to a lot of animal diversity. Lots of places for animals to live and become diverse. These are the numbers I found from a couple of different uh, uh, research sources. So I'm, some of these may be different today than they were when it was initially published. But roughly speaking, I found numbers saying that there's a roughly 89,000 species of different animals in India total. Described at least. Yep, described, which breaks down to about almost 200 species of amphibian, just over 400 species of mammals and 400 species of reptiles. Okay. 1,200 species of bird and 2,500 species of fish. Okay. Because fish. Now, as fun as just listing big numbers are, A lot of these animals are charismatic, well-known animals. Like, India has some really unique and cool wildlife. Yeah, I've seen the Jungle Book. Exactly, yep. (laughs) And we will discuss the Jungle Book later on. I have a a tidbit. (laughs) Now, it has some large animals that it's important to mention, like the Asian elephant, the Indian elephant subspecies. Mm -hmm. Smaller than the African. You know, this one is notable for having just the one little finger-like thing on its trunk, not the two like the African. Uh, There's also the Indian rhinoceros. Yep. So we've got some large herbivores down there. The Indian rhinoceros, for anyone who's trying to picture, is the one that has the folded, you know, thick folded armor type skin that looks like very almost plate mail kind of look. Yeah. It's also got some cool mammalian predators, of which includes the most number of cat species of any country. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Uh, But going through... Tons of cats. I'm sure lots of little cats, but tons of big cats. Yeah, yeah. I know they've got tigers up da- down there. Yep, they've got tigers. The Bengal tiger, one of the largest cats alive. They also have the Asiatic lion, a subspecies of Panthera leo that is found in Asia. It used to be much more widespread, but now there's a small population that is found in India and I think maybe uh, one or two other countries, but we do have lions in India. And then a whole bunch of leopards. You have the Indian leopard the snow leopard, and the clouded leopard. That's a good list. Right? That's a cool list of cats. Yeah, it is. So India's got some really cool big predators, including a few species of bear. There's the Himalayan black bear, which is a subspecies of the Asian black bear, which makes sense. There's also the Himalayan brown bear, which is a subspecies of the brown bear. Oh. Yeah, this is Ursus arctos, subspecies Isabellinus. Which makes you feel a little bit better about questioning whether it was supposed to be a brown bear in Lake Placid. Because if they made it all the way over to the Himalayas... Yeah, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. Okay, I'm not going to feel bad about guessing a a brown bear somewhere anymore. But then definitely, most famously for Indian bears, is the sloth bear. Yeah. Sloth bears, a medium-sized bear. These range to be about 50 to 100 kilograms, so 120, 230 pounds. For females, males get a little bit bigger, like 80 to 140 kilograms 45 kilograms so 170 300 pounds but what makes sloth bears so interesting unique among bears is they seem to be convergently adapted to feeding on termites and ants like your other ant eater and aardvark type animals yeah so these bears have a, a slew of features that have help them specialize to feeding on insects. A weird thing for a bear to do. A very weird thing for a bear to do. The first thing you'll notice is their teeth are greatly reduced compared to other bears. Uh, their premolars and molars are much smaller. They don't tend to chew as much vegetation. They still can. You know, they are not uh, uh, insectivorous, you know, obligate ant eaters, but they don't tend to eat as much vegetation as other bears. The weirdest thing, though, is that they completely lack upper incisors their front teeth on the top jaw are gone Mm. so they can use their mouth like a straw like a sloth yep (laughs) (laughs) to slurp up ants cool and it's very common to see in adults that their teeth will be in really bad condition for all the grit they get in there as they chew up the insects oh interesting so they wear down their teeth aggressively they also have 
big powerful claws for tearing into the mounds and to get to the comb structures the you know the tunnels down there where the ants and termites will be hanging out and then once they get there they don't slurp it up with their tongue like an anteater does instead they'll as it was described puff away the soil with some breaths and then just slurp it up like you're slurping up jello just suck up ants with their mouth and then chew them up india is also known for a number of famous reptiles uh some big reptiles there are a bunch of cool snakes yeah there are yep we've got the king cobra the largest venomous snake yeah it is and when we say largest we're saying over 10 feet long yeah these can reach up to three meters and that's very very big for a venomous snake yes uh as their name suggests with the king in it they do eat other snakes ophiophagus yes and then slightly bigger than that, you know, some might say, is the reticulated python. The longest snake in the world. Yeah, that it, that is very true. These snakes can reach right up to 20 feet. Yep, and over. And over. This is the longest snake, and in the top three of the heaviest. Yep. This is a big old snake. This is one of the few snakes that's not venomous that is a threat to people. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to give you an idea. I also found that they have been known, they're very good swimmers, which I knew, but that they've been found at sea and have populated islands. Oh, interesting. Yeah, which I wasn't aware of. So, huh. giant... This is a sea serpent it's right here. Sea, <laughs> sea, sea-going pythons. But, not to be bested, there are also a bunch of crocs. Eh. Yeah, yeah, eh. there are. All right, cool. <laughs> what else is in India? <laughs> and moving up. Now, we have three crocs there. We have the mugger croc, which is the characteristic croc of India. Like, they're found throughout the range. If you see a video of a croc in India, you're probably seeing a mugger croc. Medium size, these get just a little bit bigger than American alligators, so like 16 feet typically max. You do also find the saltwater crocodile here, the Indo-Pacific croc, the estuarian croc, uh, because, yep, if it's near that area of the world, there you find these crocs. But by far the most unique and unusual is the gharial, the one and only gharial. The Indian gharial, as it sometimes will be called, which is redundant since there's just the one, <laughs> is the famous one with the very long, thin snout and thin pointy teeth, excellent for catching small, water-going creatures. These also are one of the larger species of crocodilian. They can reach almost 20 feet. So, like, this is a very large species, but it's pretty much harmless because that jaw is not made for taking down large prey. Well, harmless to us. Yes, (laughs) harmless to anything (laughs) that uh, is bigger than a frog or fish or small things like that. It is a very long-lived, it's one of the longest living, and is often considered the most aquatic. Uh, I've seen it said, I don't know that there's been definitive research, because I'm not sure how you would confirm this, that adult gharials, if not lose the ability to do the high walk, that they just stop doing it. They will just crawl on their bellies when they come out of the water and then crawl on their be- belly back in the water, but they never actually walk. Huh. They're just, just, just really miserable to be on land. Yeah. Uh, just fine. Uh, uh. And unique among crocodilians, all crocodilians are sexually dimorphic. The males and females are different sizes and males being much larger and having typically more robust features. The gharials are the only one that show a obvious sexual display with the males having a bulb on the end of their snout a bony knob which is called the gara named after a pottery a a form of indian pottery that gave them their name and then of course there's a ton of other cool animals like that it's full of life there we can't go over all of them uh, those are those are some of the ones that jumped out at me that felt like they needed to be mentioned. <laughs> those are the ones that uh, fit into our personal bias. Yep, that I thought were the coolest, so I decided <laughs> to tell you all about. Uh, but there's tons so, of cool things. <laughs> if we skipped your favorite Indian animal, let us know. Absolutely, send us a comment or a we, message. We will take. We do uh, take criticisms and complaints. Yeah, in the form <laughs> of cool animals. Yes, yes, yeah. uh, and plants. Yep. And I don't know if you have a favorite Indian fungus. Let us know about that, too. I did find some numbers about how many fungus were there, but I didn't uh, find any, like... Probably tons. Lots, of, lots, a lot. There yeah, was big I numbers. Uh, but I didn't find any notable famous ones. Lots mention. of forest, lots of warm, wet environments. Yeah. That's where they like... paradise. <laughs> it's where they like to grow. <laughs> so now we can start talking a little bit about India's history. As usual, when we talk about a location, we kind of have to, you know, move through quickly because there's so much we could cover. But... We can start talking a little bit about what India used to be like, you know, where it used to be and what used to live there. And India's geologic history has three distinct phases 
which is it used to be part of you know Pangaea as all continents were, but then Gondwana, the southern continents, before it left, became an island and rammed its face into Asia. <laughs> so India has a when I lived in the south yep. phase. When I was in transit. When I was backpacking across the Teth Sea. <laughs> <laughs> and then as part of the northern continents. Yep. India moved from the southern continents to the northern continents. Absolutely. So we're going to kind of go through India in its phases. The first being Gondwanan or pre-insular India, as it's sometimes called. Uh, insular meaning, of course, separated as an island. Yep. Before it was an island, it was part of Gondwana. Now, once again, as a refresher, for a time, all continents were grouped together as Pangaea, and India was no exception. While it was part of Pangaea, it was smushed in between Madagascar and Africa and Australia. And so to its, to its west, we had Madagascar attached to it with connections to Africa, and to its east, Australia attached to it. Just all three of them hanging out together, talking about how someday they would each get their own episode of the Common Descent Podcast. 40, 50, and 119. <laughs> in the early Permian, we see a rift start to form in Pangaea as things start to separate north and south. It hasn't split yet, but there is a opening now. This opening of water is what becomes known as the Neo-Tethys Ocean. So this will be the Tethys Ocean. As we move into the Jurassic, Pangaea continues to rift, and we get our northern supercontinent of Laurasia and our southern supercontinent of Gondwana, which at this point, India is still firmly attached to. And it won't be until later in the Cretaceous that India starts thinking about heading out of here. So for most of the Mesozoic, India is a Gondwanan landmass, connected to all the other southern continents and sharing their wildlife. So... During that time, the things on India are pretty similar to the things on Madagascar and the surrounding area. Right. So Gondwana back then is, like you said, Madagascar, Australia, Africa, South America, Antarctica, the southern gang. Yep. But even with that, we do find some cool, unique fossils to India from this time. One from the Triassic, about 245 million years old. This is a reptile known as Shringosaurus indicus. Oh, that, that weird one that came out a few years ago. Absolutely. This is a truly bizarre, fairly large-sized reptile. Triassic reptile was over 10 feet long. You know, so three meters, three to four meters, potentially. That had a fairly small head on a kind of longish neck. Not like sauropod, you know, not long neck long, but... Yeah, like a, a horse. Yeah, kind of like a horse ish. neck. But then this short kind of pugged face with two forward curving horns... Very similar to like Triceratops almost. Yeah. Uh, and was actually notable because we didn't think horns like that evolved before the Ceratopsians. <laughs> and so this was an, a non-Ceratopsian set of very similar horns. And is just the weirdest, coolest looking. It looks like a creature made for those old bee monster movies. Yeah. Well, I remember when Shringosaurus was published not too long ago. And there was a whole lot of discover discussion about... Uh, is this a correct interpretation of the body shape of this animal? Yes. Like, was it actually this weird or is there something wrong with the preservation of the fossils? Yeah, have we made a mistake somewhere in our interpretation yeah. and made you into a way bigger weirdo than you actually are? <laughs> there are also some notable multi-tuberculate fossils in India during this time. So multi-tuberculates, a group of very, very successful mammals that are they're kind of rodent-ish is. Yeah. So sort of rodents before rodents. Yeah. And also alongside rodents. <laughs> yes, they survived exactly. for quite a while. They were on the planet for 166 million years. Yep. Which is, from what I found, the longest history of any mammal lineage. Like, uh -huh. they were around the longest from what I found. Now, evidently, multi tuberculate fossils are not particularly well known from Gondwana during this time. So they're fairly rare. You know, they're, they're not completely absent, but they're not well known. And so it actually wasn't until 2013 that the first Indian multi-tuberculate fossil was found. Oh, cool. So it's fairly recent that we have India representation of this group from the Mesozoic. Yeah. Multi-tuberculates are this, like you said, very rodent-like, but they go all the way back to the age of the dinosaurs, like we're discussing, and they're famous for their just super bizarre teeth. Oh, they're so weird. 
multi tuberculate named for just the many cusped these long teeth with all sorts of bumps all over them very strange yeah it, it's once you see a multi tuberculate tooth you will never forget them <laughs> well before the discovery of this india a specimen some of the oldest multi tuberculates in guanduana were known from the early cretaceous like morocco these seem to be lower or middle jurassic Okay. Uh, which could potentially make them the oldest Gondwanan multi tuberculates. Oh, interesting. Maybe India was the path that they took to mm. spread down into Gondwana. Yeah, so India might have played a key role in the early, you know, spreading or or dispersal of multi tuberculates. Very cool. There's another one of these, like a surprisingly rare. There's only, from what I could find, one Indian ichthyosaur. Ooh. Hey, yeah, we talked about those in episode 116. Yep, yeah, and this one was found in 2017, so very recently. I feel like paleontology in India has been picking up recently, similar to how it has been in a lot of Asian countries that are sort of now getting the research attention that a lot of the Western countries have been getting for a longer time. Yeah, so it'll be exciting to see if some of these stay rare or if we end up finding that there's way more to be found. <laughs> Was this an ichthyosaur haven we just don't know yet? <laughs> exactly. And that's actually uh, what I found talking about this ichthyosaur. This is a uh, one that's about 150 million years old, a decent size, 16 foot long, and a really good condition. They said it was nearly complete, that it could serve to rewrite a lot of our understanding of the spread of ichthyosaurs in that area now that we have one from india and then of course there are tons of dinosaurs many of which though we'll talk about a little bit later because they are from a different phase in india's history but a couple of notable ones uh one is cotosaurus which is a sauropod from the early jurassic and was described at least in the sources i found as one of the most basal sauropods known Oh, so these are, of course, your long neck, long tail dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. And we discussed in episode 101 that sauropods had a number of phases in their evolutionary history. And I remember talking about that transition from the prosauropods of the Triassic to the true sauropods, right? The column-legged animals we're familiar with moving into the Jurassic. Absolutely. And it has a four-legged stance. It is quadrupedal, so it's not standing up on back legs like many prosauropods were, but still retains many either prosauropod features or prosauropod reminiscent features. Mm -hmm. I didn't find a detailed description of exactly what all those were, but this evidently is a member of very, very early basal sor true sauropods. Cool. And then also from the early Jurassic, there was a theropod genus known as Dendacosaurus, which is a decently sized predator, about 10 meters, 30 feet, 33 feet long, uh, but is not super well known, uh, which is comes up with a number of the dinosaurs that we'll talk about. There's, there's a few of these that are, we'll, you'll see mentioned with lists of Indian dinosaurs, but are also probably could do with a bit more taxonomic and, you know, species identification research. This one is known from a single partial pubis you know so we got a bone. we got a bit of the hip and that's the only fossil known from this group uh so there are some and this term does come up later consider it to be a nomen dubium which is a term used for a doubtful yeah. classification dubious name mm -hmm. this might not actually be something different or something with enough to get a name yes out of it so you find a piece of a hip and you go that this is a hip that would belong to a 30 foot long theropod, but that's also not a ton to go on for a species description. There's a couple of dinosaurs that that is kind of the situation with. Yeah. So we'll discuss those as well. I suspect that a lot of the, the my, it wouldn't surprise me to learn, I should say, if a lot of the discoveries like that in India are from fossil sites that aren't, haven't been particularly well uh, explored. And or from fossils that were transported away and eventually made their way into the hands of researchers who were then describing based on what little was available. Yes. And which has happened with a lot of lesser explored parts of the world in terms of paleontology. Yes, absolutely. Now, as we move forward in time, we reach the Cretaceous. And in the early Cretaceous, about 125 million years ago, we start to see the splitting of Gondwana. Uh, the, the band's breaking up. Yep. It starts to break up into its constituent pieces that we now see as its constituent <laughs> right, pieces. Right, our familiar yeah, constituent it pieces. It starts taking its correct shape. <laughs> uh, so it 
the land masses start to spread. Uh, India is still not its own, on its own yet. It's still glued to Madagascar during much of this time. And it's not until about 90 million years ago that it starts to separate from Madagascar and head off on its own. Ooh, off on a, a great journey. Which we will discuss after this musical break. I'm going on an adventure. <laughs> That's the wrong island. <laughs> <laughs> So 90 million years ago, India and Madagascar finally break up. Oh, yeah. It was, it was, I, I'm holding out hope for it. It was a long time coming. <laughs> I, I, I think I think it's best. They're healthier apart. Now, we definitely know that they India was separating from Madagascar or maybe separated from Madagascar by this point. But it may not be fully isolated. But by 80 million years ago, so we're getting right toward the end of the Cretaceous, India is definitely on its own and starting to move north. Now, we've talked about plate tectonics before, uh, yeah. the movement of the continents and the land masses across the Earth's surface as the land is either pushed up in sections or brought down and melted back into molten layers. Yeah, the, the, the crust is a bunch of puzzle pieces that are constantly conveyor belting in various directions, dragging continents along with them. Now, typically, this is a very slow process. It's a very ponderous process. India, as far as plate tectonics go, is booking it. Oh, yeah. India is a speed demon. I found it listed as the fastest tectonic movement that we've found in Earth's history. I, I've heard that before. Yeah. India just rockets north at nine meters a century. Oh, man. <laughs> Slow down. <laughs> You get whiplash, with right? That. <laughs> <laughs> so it is booking it. You you wouldn't want to fall into a coma on India. Wake up and be just seven feet away from where you. Started. Yeah, you wouldn't know what to do. You'd be all turned around. <laughs> Your GPS would be very confused. Now that's also, I think, the average speed. So I think there were times where it was going faster. I saw fifteen uh, meters a century oh. at one point, but I don't know if that's an upper estimate or right but it was moving very fast as far as giant chunks of land go yeah for comparison continental movement today is significantly slower than that yes like it's it's uh, it's often compared to the rate of fingernail growth mm -hmm. i've seen that comparison made yeah. of yeah usually on the on the order of centimeters per year or years mm -hmm. so this is very very fast and this sudden movement is often attributed to the potential triggering of the Deacon Traps at the end of the Cretaceous. Yeah, the massive volcanic province. Mm, which is in India. Yep. So as India leaves the Cretaceous behind, it might have helped trigger <laughs> the end of the Cretaceous. <laughs> <laughs> if indeed the Deacon Traps Listen, are connected to that. It was going through a tough breakup at the time. <laughs> It was very emotional. <laughs> it took a lot of people down with it. <laughs> a lot of relationships were burnt. A lot of bridges were burnt here. Now, to, just to give a, a concept of how quickly it closes the gap, it is definitely moving north by 80, 84 million years ago and begins to meet Asia about 50, 55 million years ago. Right. So in 30 million years, it crosses the Tethys Ocean. Yes. <laughs> like, that's very fast as far as movement of land goes. Some people are not comfortable being separated. <laughs> and they, they really want to be in a connected yeah, space. Yeah, uh, Asia is the, the rebound. <laughs> so in this time, India is an island. Yes. Uh, which is very intriguing because we've talked about islands a whole bunch. Weird stuff tends to happen on islands. It does. Now, India has kind of a weird history as an island. Because it is relatively on its own for 50-ish million years. Because it doesn't fully connect with Asia right when it starts to get close. It's still slightly separated or separated at times. You know, it may be isolated for periods when the ocean rises and then connected a bit more. So around 50 million years of this time, India is kind of on its own. But probably only about 11 of those were truly isolated, insular island India. 
right. able to do its own weird stuff. You can imagine that as a continental mass moves away from one area and towards another, like you said, you're going to have sea level changes might expose different land masses. You might have collections of islands. Mm-hmm. So the isolation is not quite, you know, if you think of Australia today, Australia is a very isolated space, but it's also surrounded by a bunch of islands of various sizes. It's isolated to a point. Yeah, and it wasn't an island for a super long time. You know, not like Australia, which separated and then stayed separate for a very long time. Right. India was an island for a little bit before it bumped into continents again. So it's not quite Australia or South America in terms of its isolation history. Absolutely. And there are some surprising evidence of interchanges of species. We see lots of evidence of species coming over from Africa and Europe, which at that time was an archipelago, so islands. It wasn't, you know, solid landmass. There's also potential evidence for migrations from Asia even before it started to collide. So due to either island hopping or potential land bridges coming up here and there as water levels change and the earth moves around, India was not on its own for a lot of this time, which means a lot of the things, especially early on in this movement, a lot of the wildlife and a lot of the organisms on India look pretty similar to surrounding land masses, like Madagascar and India look pretty much the same during a, the beginning section of this movement. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would imagine it would make sense to see that India looks very African in the early stage of this transit and then starts to look more and more Asian as it gets closer to Asia. Yeah, and that's that's very much kind of what we see. So for the tail end of the Cretaceous, while it's starting to move, most of the dinosaurs, uh, most of the other archosaurs pretty much look like Madagascar. Even different species often are very similar. You know, so a, an Indian species might be very, very reminiscent of a Madagascar, of a Madagascar species. But there are a few uh, potential deviations that I found listed. There does seem to maybe be evidence of a troodontid, which are small, typically smaller theropod, you know, two-legged dinosaurs. Yeah, the not too far from Velociraptor. Yeah, that are usually more well-known from Laurasia, the northern continents but there may be fossil evidence for some in india during the in cretaceous which could potentially hint at early exchanges between either asia or europe even as far back as cretaceous but i did see some mentions that it might not be troodontid it might be just another theropod or even like a notasuchian so not for sure another one of those may be a odd dinosaur to be found here is a dermal plate, a bony back plate that might be stegosaur. Interesting. Which would be a Cretaceous stegosaur in India. And stegosaurs are a group much better known from the Jurassic. So if this were the case, it would be a, a stegosaur in a place we do not expect to find it. Interesting. But once again, studies on it could mean that it, it might be a dermal plate from a sauropod. Yeah. You know, they are known to have armor. So it's not for sure Stegosaur, but there are a couple of dinosaurs in there that might be kind of weird, you know, might be kind of unique to India. But one of the biggest groups, which I was not aware were so famous in India, are Titanosaurs. Yep. Uh, yeah, the big sauropods. Are typically very famous for coming from South America. Uh, also, a number of species noted in India. The first one you'll typically see mentioned is Titanosaurus indicus which is often cited as the first ever dinosaur fossil discovered in India. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, in 1828, William Henry Sleeman, who was a captain of the East India Company, discovered part of this dinosaur and sent it off to London, as well as the Indian Museum in Kolkata. And it was later named by Richard Lidacker in 1877 as Titanosaurus. Which is where the group Titanosaurs gets their name. Absolutely. Uh, Though I have seen a number of mentions that Titanosaurus may also be a nomen dubium, that there's people who are not quite sure its classification holds up. And I know there are a couple of other Titanosaurs that were grouped with Titanosaurus that are now in different genuses uh, these days. Part of the biggest reason that this dubiousness is brought up is that in more recent years, researchers have looked at it and can't distinguish it from a lot of the other titanosaurs, the original material. So other titanosaurs like 
Isosaurus and Janosaurus are, you know, there are other Titanosaurus found there. And uh, I think it was Isosaurus used to be with Titanosaurus. Gotcha. So, you know, there are Titanosaurus, just maybe the first one discovered and first one named might not be. Might, might not keep that same name. Yes. Another that you may see mentioned if you go looking up Indian dinosaurs is Bruhachaeosaurus. Oh. Yeah. The huge bodied lizard, <laughs> which in earlier papers estimated it to exceed Titanosaurus such as Argentinosaurus in size. Right. But isn't Bruhachaeosaurus also supposedly a theropod? I'd say I didn't find a theropod list here, but I found a number of different uh, studies that would look at that were looking at the bones that were described of it and saying that they're probably various different bones uh. multiple times. So I, d- I did not come across the theropod, but I came across that even if it is Titanosaur, it's probably not giant, giant. Yeah, it's probably a um, big, you know, because it's a Titanosaur, but in between a couple of others. Gotcha. Uh of various different studies, uh, one in 2017 said that the holotype, part of the reason for a lot of the confusion and disagreement on the validity of the size estimate for this dinosaur and even the description of this dinosaur is the fact that in 2017, it was reported that the holotype had disintegrated. Oh. Because these fossils are in very saturated sediment due to the monsoon season and the clays that they're buried in. And during dry seasons, the shrinking and uh, and expansion of the sediment during hot and cold hot days and cold nights causes the fossils to crack and disintegrate very quickly when exposed to air which is something we've dealt with with saltville type fossils Mm -hmm. so this is something that happens to fossils buried in saturated earth very often so evidently the original fossil for this dinosaur no longer exists so it's really hard to confirm the validity of the descriptions yeah, so this is the Amphicelius <laughs> situation, which is another example of a supposedly super giant sauropod, the specimens of which don't exist anymore. Yep, and there's a 2019 study by Gregory Paul. In their opinion, the tibia that was described is probably a femur, <laughs> which would put it just between a couple of other titanosaur groups like Dreadnoughtus and Futalongosaurus. So not at all the top tier biggest titanosaur, meaning that the idea of it being this gigantic land animal is probably more mythical than anything else. Mm-hmm. And the one of the closing remarks was, this is in some ways fortunate considering the extremely problematic status of its remains. Yeah. So like there's, and then there was a study just the next year in, 2000, in 2020 that suggested that that tibia might actually be a fibula. As well. So like hmm. th- this dinosaur's, got a lot of issues there's it, a lot of disagreement if i remember correctly at least some of these remains were originally identified as theropod gotcha so there's been a lot of confusion uh about this particular name to a dinosaur and the biggest reason i want to make sure we mentioned it is because i found a number of sources that were like also bruhath chaosaurus biggest titanosaur yeah you know, right here in India are famous to end mm, mm. very much like Amphicelius. You will still often hear references. Yeah, no, the biggest sauropod was Amphicelius. Uh, there are a couple different species of Amphicelius, one of which is the supposed super giant, the fossils of which have been lost to time. Yeah, so just, <laughs> just be so wary. You know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but as far as famous dinosaurs go, there's also Rajasaurus, Narmadensis, which is a Decently sized abelisaurid. Theropods. Theropods. Predators. Yeah. And this is a group of theropods known from India and Madagascar. Mm -hmm. And this dinosaur was probably very similar to Madagascar's Majungasaurus. Yeah. The abelisaurs are often cited as the southern continent's answer to Tyrannosaurus. Absolutely. Uh, Now, one of the interesting things here, this, this is a decent size, you know, six and a half meters, so... Just over 20 feet long, not giant, but not small. Though some other estimates have bumped that up to like over 30 feet, so it might have been a bit bigger. Though it closely resembled the Madagascar Majungasaurus, it was a 20 million year difference in there when they were alive. So this would be a different time period for this very similar predator. And it had a very noteworthy skull, double crested with a, a kind of small horn on the forehead. But before we can leave, 
Cretaceous fossils. There's one last one that I guess is worth mentioning that I'm pretty sure David would get pretty mad at me if I don't mention. Sanaja Indicus. Snake, the snake from the sauropod nest. Yep. Yeah, I didn't see Will's notes, by the way. Yep, I nope. Just, I knew what you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> this is indeed, right at the end of the Cretaceous, 68 million years ago, a fossil snake coiled among the eggs of a sauropod nest. Yeah, we've talked, I'm pretty sure we talked about Sanaja way back in episode three about mm-hmm. snakes. And there's a bunch of cool... Uh, there there are uh, uh, diagrammatic representations of how it was coiled up among these sauropod eggs. But I've also seen paleo art of this snake staring down hatchling sauropods as they come out of their eggs. Yep. <laughs> and a lot of you know researchers seem to think that there's strong evidence for it being a fossilized evidence of predation because the pose of the body is really well preserved. Uh, it's also... The body's in line. It hasn't been disrupted, so it doesn't look like it was brought into the nest. It looks like the snake and the hatchlings were buried together in position very quickly. Uh, these baby animals, very likely titanosaurs. Mm-hmm. Uh, so most likely either Isosaurus or Janosaurus. And they said that even though Sanjay doesn't have quite the flexible skulls of a lot of our modern snakes, it's a little less flexible in the jaw, but it doesn't quite have the fixed skull as a lot of earlier uh ancestors of modern snakes it still probably could have swallowed a hatchling the size that it was facing yeah so a very potentially a sauropod eating snake found right here in india right there in india which is that's i have to admit that's pretty it's, awesome it's a real cool fossil with a really cool name it said that the name is sanskrit for ancient gape from the indus which is a cool name <laughs> And then as we move out of the Cretaceous into the Paleocene, we are now in an India that really is truly isolated. You know, so India is on its own. It's doing its own thing. But some fossil records from this time are a bit are a bit thinner, not as well preserved. So we there, there are some inferences made of what animals we would expect to be there based on surrounding areas and where we're seeing groups that either would have had to been in India to get to where they are in a, later times but we don't have direct evidence for some of these. So there's, there's, this is a little bit of a more patchy record during this time, but we do find the first definite placental mammals here. And even though it was mostly isolated, these probably came from surrounding areas. Right. Uh, Cause some of these include things like hyenodonts, which would have needed to come from Africa and then establish themselves here in India. We also see a lineage of gliers, which is a, an Asian group at this time, which will eventually give rise to logomorphs, rabbits. And rodents. And rodents. It's in the Eocene that we see a lot of the u- really unique groups, or at this time, unique to India, uh, that don't remain unique because it, then it goes shares them with everyone else. But we do see some cool beginnings of groups during the Eocene in India. One of these is represented by a genus known as Cambatherium. Cambatherium which is a primitive perseodactyl-like, perseodactyl-like mammal and seems to be one of the most primitive of the perseodactylomorphs, which means perseodactyls very likely got their start in India. Now, they could have also been evolving in edges around in Asia and been making their way to India, but they might have also gotten their start here during this time. Oh, cool. Perissodactyls is the group that includes, eventually, horses, tapirs, and rhinos. Absolutely. So, uh, I didn't know that at all when I started doing this research. That's really cool. And speaking of groups with hooved ancestors, cetaceans also may have gotten a lot of their start in India during this time. Oh, whales. Yes. Whales, as we discussed in our whales episode. Episode 41. Started out as terrestrial animals, uh, cousins of artiodactyls. The other group of hooved animals. Even to hooved animals. Yep. So your giraffes, gazelle, deer, cows, pigs, etc., etc. Yep, yep, yep. And we find a lot of early members of the protocetids, the proto-whales, in India during this time. Yeah. As well as Pakistan, so it's mm-hmm. not a definite, yeah, but... Pachycetus and such. Mm-hmm. But some of the earliest members are known from India. In fact, the first fossils of indo one of the earliest members of this group were found in India. Yeah. So 
India may also have been the staging ground for whale evolution. Which is very cool. Which is a cool a <laughs> cool feather to put in your cap. I mean, if you're going to be out there surrounded by water, yep. what else is going to happen? One of the ones I kept seeing be mentioned, uh, which you'll know why as soon as I say the name, is Himalaya Cetus. Yep. <laughs> which was an extinct group of aquatic but still legged early whale. It was from the Ambulacetid family, so... Ambulacetus, the famous kind of otter or seal-like mm -hmm. whale ancestor. This is one of the oldest of this group found in India from 53 million years ago. Do, 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 do. And then on top of that, we also find some of the oldest logomorph fossils, as was mentioned, which includes some small ankle bones that seem to share features of the more cursorial running Logomorphs like we know today from rabbits and hares, as well as some of the more robust features of similar to like pikas. Mm -hmm. uh, so it seems to be kind of a transitional, you know, yeah, or early phase. Yes, exactly. Uh, so rabbits as well, then, you know, and yeah. their surrounding groups have early ancestors in this area. So India had a whole bunch of early mammal groups that were cooking on this landmass and then were, would eventually spread into surrounding areas when it got closer to land, uh, which is something I wasn't aware of before I started reading about it. And that's pretty awesome. And it's during the Eocene later on that we see logomorphs start to spread out from India, but also hyenodonts after spreading to India, then spreading from India. Riding India up to Asia. Exactly. So India acts kind of as a, I saw it described as a stepping stone between a lot of these landmasses for distribution and spreading of different groups. Now, as we come to about 50 million years ago, we reach the end of India's travel, or we start to reach the end of its time alone, at least. This is a, when we see the earliest evidences of the collision with Asia. So the landmass of India begins to collide with the landmass of Asia. Yep. And that means we are closing the Tethys Ocean and opening the Indian Ocean, which I found very ironic. That's just remove this across and go, it's now the Indian Ocean. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I passed it. It's mine now. I've claimed this ocean. <laughs> I swam the length. <laughs> I get to name it. As India hits Asia, it causes a whole bunch of uplifting of land. As the two lands smush together and collide, mountains raise up. This is responsible for, in big part, the Alps in Europe the Caucasus Range in Western Asia, and the Himalayan Mountains, and the Tibetan Plateau in Southern Asia. Mm -hmm. Mountains all over the place on all sides start raising up as it just plows into Asia. Yeah. And it plows fast. Yes. It's like a full-on uh, uh, oncoming traffic collision. <laughs> and so lots of uplift, lots of mountain building. And indeed, I often see it cited that mountain building in this area is still going on. Absolutely. India the, has not stopped moving. It's it is still moving north, and the Himalayas are still experiencing uplift. Absolutely. Uh, the collision is in process as we speak. It's slowed down considerably. Yes, as most things do when they crash. We also see the Indian, the Indian plate, so the surrounding land even under the water around India, suture, connect and fuse with the Australian plate. So now they become a much larger piece of land, often called the Indo-Australian plate. Yeah, a big chunk of the crust. And it's very likely that full contact, you know, actual India becoming one with Asia didn't happen until about 35 million years ago. Right, because the plates are interacting at the crust, right, mm -hmm. deep, deep below the surface of the ocean. And then a lot of the continental land mass is under the water. Yeah, so if you were looking from a bird's eye point of view, India's land, you know, India the country and Asia the continent were hitting each other, but you wouldn't have seen the shores touch. Right. You for wouldn't quite have been able time. to walk over there yet. And so India still had a little bit of isolation, you know, during that not quite 20 million years as it was hitting India or as it was hitting Asia and connecting with it. But once it does connect, we see a huge influx of Asian species. Uh, animals come in and, in big part, displace and replace a lot of 
what were endemic Indian groups. Yeah, we talked about that happening with South America in mm-hmm. episode 74. Also in episode 43, when we talked about the American interchange. Yeah, exactly. So that's kind of what happens here. And so the percent of indigenous, you know, unique Indian species plummets, yeah. which is very much reflected in India today. Uh, there's not a huge level of endemic groups. Uh, like mammals, only about 12% are only found in India. Mm -hmm. Uh, Reptiles are a bit better. There's 45% evidently of reptiles and amphibians. uh, So close to 50 for both of them. Cool. And plants were at about 33%. So it's not that all groups shot down, but mammals, we lost a lot of the unique Mm -hmm. Indian mammals. Uh, Same with birds. There's only about 4%, 4.5% of birds are endemic. Yeah. Which makes, birds are very mobile. Yeah, they can fly kind of wherever they want. That makes sense. (laughs) But a fun note is a lot of this interchange had to happen in two spots on either side of the Himalayas. Yes. (laughs) Because India tried to make itself a gated community, (laughs) but didn't quite close it up. But India doesn't become completely recognizable right away. There are still a number of really interesting fossil groups found in India post-collision before we get to the way it looks today. One of the ones that I was very happy to see is orangutans. Yeah. Yeah. There used to be fossil groups of orangutans in India, specifically two species. So there are only three species of orangutan today, none of which are found in India. But in the past, we had Sivapithecus and Indopithecus, cousins of the orangutans. Now, if that name sounds familiar, it's because we used to think that there was a jaw of Gigantopithecus, Mm. the very famous giant ape found in India, but that since has been renamed as Indopithecus. Gotcha. Gigantopithecus is Chinese. Yes. And so this was thought to be a Indian example, but now it's been renamed. Still a very large ape. You know, mm-hmm. it didn't change its size. <laughs> when we say giant ape, we're talking about like four to six hundred pounds potentially, so two to three hundred kilograms. Which is why I wanted to mention Jungle Book, because when they made the remake yeah, the, the live, quote, live action. The remake. live action with one live action person in it. Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> they uh, had a Gigantopithecus. Yeah. Christopher Walken's voiced King Louie as a Gigantopithecus because though I love the animated movie, orangutans aren't from India. Nope. So you can't have, you can't be a good accurate and have an orangutan there. Right. But you also can't get rid of King Louie in your remake. No. Because of Because course. then I'm not going to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> And so they said, well, if we just go a little cryptid with it and say there's one remaining <laughs> Gigantopithecus, we can have an orangutan-like ape yeah. hanging out. And he says in the song, Gigantopithecus. It, it may seem ridiculous that me, a Gigantopithecus, we should reword it as Indopithecus now. Yes. So, dear Disney, <laughs> when you remake The Jungle Book again. Please, please call Christopher Walkins. Call, <laughs> call him up. Tell him he's an Indopithecus now. <laughs> I read that and I went, oh, I need to tell everyone. I need to, Disney must know. It is also during this time that we see a lot of the modern characteristic groups uh, start their fossil records. The mugger crocodile and gharial earliest fossils come from this time Ooh. after collision. We see our first mugger fossils around the Pliocene, you know, just a little bit more than 4 million years ago. We see some specimens that pretty much resemble the modern species. We also find specimens of species known as Crocodilus paleonticus, which may be ancestral, an ancestor group or close relative of ancestors to the mugger crocodile from the Pliocene. And also from Pliocene, these are actually all from the the Savalic Hills, the fossil sites there, we find the earliest gharial fossils. So the characteristic Indian crocs pop up during this time after it collides. And a little bit later in the Pleistocene is when we get our first evidences of the sloth bear. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, Baloo, I assume, yes, from the Jungle Book is a sloth bear. I didn't know they ate ants. That that's right there in the in the movie. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Try a few. Yeah. There there are some fragmentary bones from the Pleistocene that look very similar to the sloth bear, but also from the Savalic Hills, we find some fossil skulls, bear skulls, early Pliocene, maybe Pleistocene, that come from a bear named Melursus Theobaldi which is thought to potentially be the ancestor to sloth bears. Okay, cool. Yes, a lot of the so characteristic. O- over the last yeah, four or five million years, it sounds like, some of our familiar things start showing up. Mm-hmm. But all is not familiar. There are still some weirdos. 
It is during this time that we used to have Indian Oryx, the giant bovid. The first fossils of the Indian subspecies show up around like 2 million years ago and were actually domesticated by at least 9,000 years ago as what would be known as the Zebu. Yeah, Indian cattle. Yep. And so giant bovids would have been roaming around during this time. And then the one that I absolutely have fallen in love to is Civitherium. Yes. Shiva's beast. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Which is a giraffid in the same group as giraffes and okapis. It's known outside of India as well. Uh, This group is known from Africa and India. Uh, You'll find them there from the Miocene to Pleistocene. But while it resembled giraffes, more kind of an okapi, so not long, skinny, but a little thicker neck, it was way bigger. Estimates put it at two meters, seven feet at the shoulder, and total height would have been three meters or almost 10 feet. And its head was covered in big, massive horn-like structures. It had these wide antler like horns and then a secondary pair above the eyes so just this big crown like structure of horns on its head and depending on the estimates uh some estimates have it being around 400 to 500 kilograms so 800 to a thousand pounds but more recent ones have it reaching all the way up to a thousand kilograms or almost 3,000 200 700 pounds which would make it one of the biggest ruminants of all time yep it rivaling today's giraffes and the largest bovids that live. So this would be potentially one of the biggest of this group. And it had these awesome horns and its name was Shiva's Beast. <laughs> I love it so much. These cool, weird giraffes. And then I was only able to find one example of human ancestor remains. A Homo erectus skull that is often called the Naramata skull or Naramata man. I saw it called a couple of times which is so far the oldest one known from India okay, and could be ancestral to groups there. But I didn't see that much more was known because it sounds like it's just the skull. Uh, But there's at least one, one homo skull. Cool. Which is cool. Now, before we can wrap up, you know, we've gotten almost to the modern day. I kind of breezed over the mountain making and, yeah. and then some mountains happen. And then some mountains happen. What more is there to say? Moving on. <laughs> Not like these were like super famous or significant or world shaping mountains or anything. No. So, okay, let's talk about the Himalayas. <laughs> Welcome <laughs> to the to Himalayas. Himalayas. <laughs> the crashing of India into Asia created the Himalayas completely. That is why they're there. And the Himalayas are a massive range of mountains stretching some 2,400 kilometers or 1,500 miles between the Indian and Tibetan, the Indian subcontinent and the Tibetan plateau. They cross five different countries. (laughs) (laughs) And over 52 million people live among the Himalayan mountains. These are the world's highest peaks. They hold many of the highest peaks and... The highest peak. Mount Everest. Mount Everest. 29,029 feet? That's a guess from my memory. That could be wrong. Did you say, say how much? What did you say? 29,029? 29,031 is what I... Ah, yeah. I well, <laughs> I guess I'll turn in my... <laughs> but, but all this means is that you were correct that it's constantly changing height. Ah, ah that's, that must be it. It's gone up two feet two since feet. the last time See? I learned about nah, it. You need to go back and measure it. Uh, so yeah. Almost 30,000 feet high to the summit, to the tippy top point. Mm -hmm. Tallest mountain in the world. But also the Himalayas hold over 50 mountains that exceed 23,000 feet. Yeah. Uh, So that's 7,000 meters for those and over almost 9,000 meters for Everest. Yeah. Now for the sticklers out there, these are the highest mountains in the world. We are aware of Hawaii. These are not the tallest mountains. Yes, exactly. From their base. Yes. These are the highest above sea level. Yeah, mountains. yeah. Uh, not <laughs> including the ones in the ocean. Terrestrial mountains. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> now, these mountains, of course, began to form about 50 million years ago mm-hmm. as the collision started. And they're still at it. And they're still at it. India is still moving north. So it is still affecting the height of these mountains. Now, the reason they're not constantly just getting taller is erosion and gravity yes the mountains are wearing away with rain and wind and weather and all that good stuff but also mountains are heavy and will actually push the land underneath them down yes 
I have seen discussions about what is the limit of how <laughs> big a mountain can be on Earth before, you know, it just starts collapsing. And I have seen some, and I don't have any scientific references for this, but I have seen some people suggest that the Himalayas might be near the limit of how tall a mountain can be on Earth. Which, that makes sense to me. Now, when we say growth and changing height, we're talking like a centimeter a year. Yes. Uh, growing upward. So it's not shooting up. They're not going through mountain puberty anymore. Right. It is constantly in fluctuation. These are an active mountain range. They are not old and tired. But the story of this collision is not as clear cut as it may seem. What I have learned is that mountain building events are never simple. Right? When we first see the evidence of collision, of the Himalayas raising and of India hitting Asia, is at earliest 55 million years ago. That's the first signs. But... According to our records of how we what we found of where India would be at the time, it is, I found one that's put it, strikingly far south to be hitting Asia. Mm -hmm. And this has revealed that if India is indeed colliding with Asia at that time where it was, there is a missing length of land about 2,500 kilometers long. That should be there, but is not on India today. Right. So for it to be hitting India when it did, it should have been much bigger than it is today. Yeah. So maybe it got smushed. There's a few different ideas of what might have happened. Interesting. This is where it gets complicated. So one thing that might have happened is it could have been subducted. That a yes. chunk of India, the greater India as it's often called, when it was bigger, mm -hmm. when it hit Asia... A portion of it, not all of it, because obviously it's not still subducting, but the first chunk went under Asia and was eaten and disappeared. So we lost that chunk, making India seem much smaller than it would have been. Now, the issue with this is, why did you stop subducting? Mm -hmm. You know, if you subducted that part, why didn't the rest subduct? The fact that the mountains are still going up seems to suggest that maybe that's not it had a little bit of evidence against if you're now hitting head on. So maybe some seduction, but it doesn't fully satisfy everyone. Another idea is not that India was actually bigger, but that instead it was relatively similar size to what we see now. But as it moved, it pushed land out of the way that would have been closer than it seems now. So that that the face of Asia that it was coming to meet was low, extended farther south than we realize. Yes. And okay. then India smushed it aside. Pushed it all up and out of the way as it moved in. And so now where the barrier is, it seems like Asia's too far up. Gotcha. So maybe it just moved stuff. Then I came across some research from 2013, which is super interesting which has found evidence that the collision actually might have happened in two stages. Of course. At, mountain building. Yep. At 50 million and 40 million years ago, they came to this conclusion by to try to understand the collision of India, looking at a similar collision that is currently going on between Australia and a series of islands called the, called the Sunda Arc. Now, this has only been happening over the last 2 million years, so it's... More recent, not nearly as dramatic, but we are seeing a similar impact. They looked for isotopes that were known to morph due to things like time and tectonic disturbance. They found two groups of isotopes. One, which is an isotope of lutetium that decays into hafnium, and another, which is samarium and decays into neodymium. They found, in the Australia example, that rocks that were high in these isotopes likely formed before the collision, and rocks that were low in these isotopes likely formed after the collision. And when they went to the Himalayas to look at a section known as the Kohistan Ladakh Arc, this arc is found in the northwestern edge of the Himalayas, they found similar signatures in the rocks there, with the rocks older than 50 million years, pre-collision, same ratios of isotopes north and south of the arc. With rocks younger than 50 million years around the along the southern 
edge of the arc. Rocks found younger than 50 million years on the southern edge of that arc showed a range of ratios in the isotopes, suggesting that there had been tectonic disturbance. But along the northern edge of the arc, we didn't see that same disturbance until 40 million years ago. So maybe two pulses of tectonic activity. And what they think those pulses were is that at about 50 million years ago, India hit a string of islands Mm. in between itself and Asia, which have been dubbed the Kohistan Ladakh Arc. And then it smushed those islands into Asia about 40 million years ago. Yeah. That would make up that gap in distance as well. Interesting. So potentially the collision was much more complex than it initially seemed. And there may not be missing land, but new land we weren't aware of. Yep. (laughs) So one way or another, 40 to 50 million years ago, we are getting Himalayas as we know them. To put that into context for people, that is a little bit younger than the Rocky Mountains Mm -hmm. here in North America, which I, I believe are thought to have begun forming in earnest around 70 million years ago. And at that time, the Appalachian Mountains were already ancient. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) I also saw a post that made the point that the fact that the Himalayas started being upthrust about 50 million years ago also brings into perspective how quickly these mountains grew because they became the highest mountain range in the world in that amount of time. Yes. (laughs) Yep. In fairness to the Appalachians, they had been eroding for a while. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 uh, the mountain equivalent of bald spots now. It's these yeah. are these are mountains in their prime, you know, past their prime. There's a ton more that we could discuss about the Himalayas in terms of their what lives there and all that. What always strikes me is that the Himalayas, my favorite uh, geological note about the Himalayas, is that. They are so large and so dramatic in their formation that they affected the climate, (laughs) not like obviously the local climate, like the modern monsoon cycle as we know it in that area is influenced by the existence of the Himalayas. But it has also been suggested, though not necessarily a definite by itself thing, that the rising of the Himalayas is related to the cooling trend across the Cenozoic era. Because the Himalayas are a whole lot of rock put up into the atmosphere, which makes it a prime area for chemical weathering, which absorbs carbon dioxide. And when you draw a carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, you create cooling temperatures. Yep. (laughs) The rising of the Himalayas might have been a factor in the cooling trend that led to the formation of grasslands, and the eventual onset of the Ice Age. It's like uh, the, it's like the climactic equivalent of cooling rods being put into a uranium reactor. <laughs> it's just yep. we thrust these mountains up into the sky and just sucked all the carbon yeah. out. So there's a whole bunch of cool Himalaya stuff, which I suppose must be, you know, for a Himalayas episode at some point. Uh, if anyone asks for it. Yeah, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe somebody will want, will want that. But this is going to kind of bring us to the end of our discussion. There, of course, like you just said, the Himalayas could be their whole episode. Tons of things could be explored further. So if there's something we didn't mention, there's an India group that we didn't mention, please speak up and let us know. If there's one If there's one you want to hear more about, we'll always be happy to talk more. But for now, we can start heading toward the end. But before we wrap up the episode completely, we have a patron question. We sure do. Yeah. One of the benefits our patrons can get, other than extra goodies, is at a certain level you can ask us questions that we will then answer here on the podcast. David, what's our question today? Today's patron question comes from Ian, who writes, Not sure if you've answered this before, but I'm curious how primates came to live in both South America and Africa if those continents split before primates evolved. Is my timeline just off? Did one group sail across the ocean and then become New World monkeys? Good question, Ian. Yes. Yep. No, you you got it right off the bat. <laughs> One group sailed across the ocean and became New World Monkeys. We did actually talk about this uh, in an earlier episode, although in Ian's defense, that was four years ago yeah. in episode seven. <laughs> it's That's so crazy. So yes, you're absolutely right that old world, new world monkeys, African, South American, 
evolved after those continents were no longer hanging out. Yeah, so primates in the old world today includes a lot of those monkeys and also apes, yep. lemurs, etc. But yeah, there's a bunch of South American, Central American monkeys. And as far as the fossil record tells us, yeah, the suggestion is there's there's multiple options. It could be that they rafted across from Africa to South America. Okay. Which, as we've discussed, sounds insane to suggest, but is a thing we know happens. Yes. That, like, a chunk of landmass or, like, a chunk of jungle gets washed out to sea during a storm or something and can travel on ocean currents and eventually drop off whatever animals happen to be, have hitched a ride. But there's also suggestion for some sort of land bridge of, like, islands that could be more hopped across than just a full, you know, three-hour tour ocean voyage, <laughs> uh, that if there were periodic land, uh, if not full bridge connection, but smatterings of islands or something mm -hmm. that could have aided in that passage. And uh, there's a lot of researchers who seem to like that idea. Uh, so it may not have been just fully sailing, but little shorter trips. Yeah. Because Africa and South America, and indeed, like, the whole of the Atlantic Ocean was open well before we see these monkeys show up in the New World. Incidentally, the same trip that the monkeys make seems to have been how rodents got to yeah. South America. Rodents did the same thing, so we have New World rodents. Now, I did see one thing that mentioned that the only other option is that they would have had to go up and around into North America and then come down. Right, up into... Uh, the Middle East, across Asia, all the way up north, into North America, all the way down North America and into South America. Which, there is one group of primates that did that, <laughs> and it was us, who was Homo sapiens, but way later. Yeah, we're here to kill everything. We <laughs> we came a we long did. way. We, came, we, we, we finally found these monkeys. <laughs> so, like, that could have happened, but there's zero fossil evidence that that is the path they took. Right, the fossils exist in Africa and Southern Asia and South America. So it's more likely that they made their way across the water. Yeah, they went on an incredible journey. Yes. Like India. <laughs> so yeah, no, I, I love, I, I, when I was reading the question, is this maybe what happens? Yep. Nope. Yeah, no, you, you nailed it. You answered your question <laughs> and asking it. So well done. That was perfect. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Uh, thank you to all of our patrons who support us. Thank you to all of our listeners who listen to us. If you'd like to get the opportunity to ask us a question, that's one of the patron goodies. So as we mentioned at the top of the episode, if you'd like to support us financially, if you like what we do, or you just like the idea of supporting science education in a free public format, consider joining our Patreon. Absolutely. Thanks again to our requesters for this for this great topic. It was tons of fun learning about India. Yep, like Will said, if we didn't talk about a thing you wish we had, let us know and make it a request for a future episode. Check out the blog post. There'll be pictures. There'll be links to a lot of the sources that we were covering in this episode. We are open to requests, comments, questions, etc. on our social media, in our email, the things we mention in the outro all the time. And with that, we release episodes every fortnight. Next up is episode 120. 120. Some of you are going to like that one. I, I could I could see that one being popular. One or popular. two people, uh, maybe. maybe. You know, well, we'll see. We'll it, see. It's it, kind yeah. of an obscure topic. We've a little got niche. You know, it's a little, little, yeah. a little bit underground yeah. sort of. Maybe crowd. you've heard about it. Yeah, <laughs> so, I was a fan of this before it was cool. <laughs> Back in 1904. <laughs> we'll see you then. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.